Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Professor Rena Bose. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, today to our panel on discussing the uh, national security challenges in 2021 and beyond. Our distinguished panel of speakers today are uh, joining us from the U.S. Army War College in Carlisle, PA. Uh, they are speaking as part of the Eisenhower Series College program, which is uh, more than 50 years old, uh, was created to encourage dialogue on national security and public policy between U.S. military officers who are studying at the Army War College and the, civi uh, and the civilian public. Uh, I'm going to turn the uh, uh, the uh, panel over to my colleague, Dr. Fritz, um, who will be the moderator for this discussion. Um, I just wanted to give a quick uh, welcome uh, to everybody on behalf of the Peter S. Calico School of Government, Public Policy and International Affairs, the Peter S. Calico Center for the Study of the American Presidency, the Department of Political Science, the Hofstra Cultural Center, um, and of course, the Hofstra Provost's Office and the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Um, we are most delighted to welcome our speakers to Hofstra. This is the second year we have speakers from the Eisenhower College Series Program. And I must say, I think maybe uh, the one area where I think we would have consensus is that the only disappointment is that this is um, the second time that we are doing this via Zoom. Uh, we had in uh, we had plans in May of 2020 to bring three speakers to campus. Dr. Fritz had worked uh, extensively with the uh, Army War College to arrange the events. And of course, in the spring of 21, um, everyone had to pivot. The benefit, I suppose I would say, is that for all of us, is that the uh, Zoom permits the educational process to continue. And at a time in American politics, when we are looking at decisions that are being made about um, changing commitments that have been in place at this point for almost two decades, um, referring specifically to the uh, Biden administration's decision to withdraw US troops from Afghanistan this fall. Um, we are at questions about uh, defense budgets, national security priorities, um, US interests at home and abroad, and the intersection of those um, of those interests in such areas as immigration, trade, refugees, uh, as I had mentioned before, defense spending, and much more. Uh, I can't think of a better way to address these topics than to bring speakers from the Army War College here to engage with us, with faculty, students, and the community to address these critically important questions. And so with that, I am delighted to um, turn the uh, hosting over to my distinguished colleague, Dr. Fritz in uh, political science to lead the discussion. Uh, thank you, Paul. Paul, you're, you're muted. Yeah, I figured that out, you know. <laughs> I, I said we were all Zoom experts after a year of this and then I do that right away. Um, I, I want to echo what Dr. Bo said, and thank you for that nice introduction. Um, this is a great privilege to have the U.S. Army War College here and the students of the War College uh, participating and sharing their ideas on, on the topics that they've researched over the course of the year. Um, and this idea, this, this dialogue uh, between national security leaders in the military and uh, civilian institutions like ours, I think is important. Um, it's important to continue the, to, 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 for, for both sides to understand each other um, and to understand what national security concerns are for our country going forward. So I think that this is a, a wonderful opportunity and I can't thank the War College enough uh, for, for doing this. And specifically, I'd like to thank Ed Kaplan, um, who was just has been wonderful to work with over the these past couple of years. Uh, he's now the deputy director of this this program, um, and uh, you know helped to schedule this and, and make this happen. So thank you very much, Ed, for um, all of your work with in this regard. Um, I'm going to introduce our our panelists today. Our our uh, distinguished panelists. They're going to speak on three different topics. Um, First, and I'm just going in alphabetical order here in the order that we'll have in presentation. Um, Lieutenant Colonel James Bartran of the US Air Force um, is a pilot of flown B-1 bombers and U-2 reconnaissance planes. 
Um, his topic is on immigration reform is critical to national security. So an extraordinarily timely topic as we see news every day of the crisis on the border um, and the need for comprehensive immigration reform. George W. Bush uh, just came out recently and said that that was his greatest mis uh, uh, regret was not being able to pass this. And so there's this is a, a very important topic. Um, next, we have Lieutenant Colonel Rena Henderson Ali Lama, Ali Lima, excuse me, I'm sorry, of the U.S. Army National Guard, who's an engineer by uh, training, um, was also Deputy Chief of Staff in support of Homeland Response Force Mission and, and other positions. She will be speaking on the tragedy of the commons, climate change and national security, uh, which again um, is could not be more timely. Uh, given we've we've seen uh, President Biden come in and call national uh, climate change a national security issue that has to be addressed. Most recently, we've seen significant outreach from the United States to China to try to get a pledge of cooperation. Uh, it's a multifaceted problem that um, uh, certainly in the past few years has become of uh, paramount importance. And our final panelist is Lieutenant Colonel Adisa King of the U.S. Army Infantry. Um, with uh, Colonel King's had five deployments, combat deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan, um, and has been the legislative liaison and aide to the acting secretary of the army. Um, Colonel King's topic is, uh, <laughs> I, I, I just, I, I'm laughing because all of these topics are so timely and so important, and this is just lined up so perfectly. Uh, Colonel King's topic is uh, the mass destruction that we commit with every click, polarization and the breakdown of civil discourse. Um, as we've seen uh, recently, um, this is maybe one of the greatest challenges that the U.S. is facing in a lot of ways is, is the way that we approach each other and the way that we um, uh, tackle problems and our inability often to understand what the other side is even saying. So um, together, I think these, these topics bring together issues that aren't always or haven't always traditionally been thought of as national security concerns, but very much should be. Um, normally with national security concerns, we think of war, we think of nuclear weapons. After 9-11, we thought of terrorism, but climate change and immigration and the way that we deal with each other internally affect the security of the country as much as anything else. Um, there's some interesting synergy here between these topics too. Um, polarization is not new, immigration is not new, climate change is not new. Uh, but the way they've interacted recently maybe is new in some ways where the increased polarization has made it much harder to deal with climate change, to deal with immigration, um, has made it such that we don't even really speak the same language when it comes to a lot of these issues. So having a critical um, yet open and honest and frank discussion about all of these issues is, is you know, possibly an opportunity to move forward. So um, with that, I, I just I'll, I'll cut my opening uh, here and, and just say thank you again for, for this, um, for these timely issues. Uh, we will proceed in the order that I listed um, with Colonel uh, Bartran going first. Um, each presentation is 10 minutes, I believe is what Ed told me. Um, after the presentations, each of the presentations, we will, uh, Dr. Bose and I will pose a few questions to the panelists, and then we will open up questions to the audience. And the way we'll handle those questions is through uh, the chat function where, where students should type in their questions to the chat and then we will direct them to the panel. So um, with that, let me first turn it over to Colonel Bartran. Greetings, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? All right, great. It's a pleasure to meet all of you. And I'd just like to start by saying uh, congratulations on uh, the endeavor of self-improvement through education. It's uh, something that we all value and it's uh, very important for our nation uh, for all of you to be doing this. So I wanted to personally say thanks for, for uh, uh, reaching out and, and uh, endeavoring in uh, education and self-improvement. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about uh, immigration reform in the United States, and specifically, I want to focus on STEM. Uh, if we look at uh, the way our nation produces hard power and the way we formulate strategy, we take into account, you know, 
our enduring beliefs, our values, our ethics, but we also look at what can the nation produce, whether it be industrial capability, uh, economic output, um, intellectual output. And a big part of that is, you know, our ability to produce uh, the minds capable of innovation, innovating and creating tomorrow's uh, technologies. And right now, the United States is facing a crisis in that endeavor. Insofar as you know, in, since 2016, China has produced over four and a half million STEM graduates, and the U.S. has only produced about 568,000. And that human capital equals national power. And our future relies on that technological innovation and distribution in space and cyber capabilities specifically, and they're essential to today's military capabilities. And in the future, artificial intelligence, bioengineering will be just as important as our ability to produce, you know, say the number of tanks, planes, or ships. If we fail to bridge this STEM gap, the knowledge that is the foundation of our military and economic security will be in jeopardy. So first I would like to start by saying this speech is not an indictment of any of our friends from abroad who want to come into the US to become American citizens or to produce within our economy. However, I think it's very important that we highlight problems with our immigration and education policies and programs that I think we can do a better job of uh, for both ourselves and our friends. So from firsthand military experience, our success in the military can often rely on our foreign partners. They bring a diversity of thought, culture, knowledge, and expertise that enlightens our perspective and can contribute to our success. I'll give you an example. In Korea, oftentimes due to cultural barriers and communication barriers, our South Korean partners will see indications and things developing in North Korea much more rapidly than we would. And they will give us those indicators and warnings before something occurs. So if we just now look at education, the government has several programs that foreign students can utilize as pathways to education and employment in the United States. One of these, which has been famously talked about in the news, is the H-1B visa uh, program, whereby employers can hire immigrant workers with certain technical skills for three years, and that can be extended up to six. Another is the Optional Practical Training, or OPT program, whereby undergraduate and graduate students with F1 status uh, who have completed or have been pursuing their degrees for more than nine months are permitted by the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, or USCIS, to work towards getting practical training to complement their field of studies. Both of these programs saw some really good promising trends between 2008 and 2016, where there was a 400% surge in foreign STEM students staying in the United States to work in many cases become American citizens. However, this trend ceased in 2018, really beginning earlier in 2016, but uh, erasing the gains uh, and it dropped by another 20%. So political rhetoric may be to blame in part, but more importantly, there were other countries that were rapidly uh, pursuing, uh, gaining some of that intellectual capital Germany, Australia, Canada were providing easier pathways for students to work and produce in their economies following graduation, while the US limited OPT and H-1B visas in favor of US citizen workers. We may wanna reconsider this, especially in STEM fields if we wish to carry out our national defense strategies successfully, which really relies on not only our international partners, but innovation, technological advancement, and research in every technical field. Now at most, only about 20% of students enrolled in STEM PhD programs are American born. Currently China is producing more than twice the STEM graduates as the US per capita. Student visas in this country are the reason that many STEM programs in our institutions of higher learning even exist. Without these student visas, many of these programs would have to close their doors for financial reasons. The United States and by extension, the military of the United States values this knowledge that these programs can bring. And the more minds we engage in STEM through a more open education society, the better our nation and subsequently our ability to defend those ideals while exporting them uh, across the globe via soft power will improve. More importantly, the more educated people we can bring into our country legally and increase our population, 
the more national power and economic output our population will possess. And when we talk about immigration in this country, we often think about the southern border. And I know in the questions, we'll, we'll get into that. But it accounts for less than a quarter of our immigration. Immigration from India and China combined are a larger portion of our immigration growth, the former being the largest. Over a million are in this country today on student visas. And some 220,000 of those are supporting our economy and national output beyond living here during their education via the aforementioned OPT program. This bridge to unemployment, or excuse me, this bridge to employment can also be a bridge for fast tracking citizenship in as little as eight months. Now, as with any human system with incentive to assert legality, there has been corruption in both of the programs I've mentioned. Unfortunately, some employers who wish to exploit cheap foreign labor, much of it in the tech sector, and some students who see incentives from their home country to conduct espionage or break our laws and live here illegally have taken advantage of these programs. Now, this led President Trump to limit the number of H-1B visas and put, quote, America first, targeting specifically both espionage and employers who were favoring foreign workers uh, to uh, squirt, skirt lower wages and benefits for American workers. While these rules have begun to roll back under the Biden administration, there are still significant hurdles and there is inertia in these large bureaucratic systems to uh, fundamentally change and go back to the open gates that we saw in 2008 through 2016. <clears throat> Indeed, the policy right now from the State Department is that it must, quote, refuse any applicants if they are not, quote, satisfied that the applicant's present intent is to depart the United States at the conclusion of his or her study. And that sounds like a system that's ripe for corruption, leaving a lot of judgment and not spelling out specific goals uh, can lead uh, individuals or organizations to take advantage of loopholes. Now, I propose lifting the restrictions and funding better oversight. Now, currently, the Department of Justice has only a small team of individuals within law enforcement called the Student and Exchange Visitor Program Division, which is a part of the Immigrations and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. And it must account for over 1.1 million visa holders. And ICE is only 20,000 personnel total. So you can imagine the daunting task that that must be for such a small team of individuals. We're not recommending more stringent rules or harassment, but rather protect the program and its opportunities from those that choose to take advantage of it through targeted accountability. And an agency has more robust resources and personnel to track down these malevolent actors is appropriate given our strategic end of perpetuating our values abroad and integrating more law abiding, tech savvy and innovative people into our society. In closing, we should change our approach from one of wide sweeping draconian restrictions to one of a target, targeted accountability and rule of law while harnessing this mental and physical power for our nation and sharing our values of liberty, justice, and individual human rights. I'd like to thank all of you again for listening to my speech and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Colonel Bortron. That was, uh, I think, very interesting, very provocative. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions on that. Um, so I want to next turn to uh, Colonel Henderson, uh, Rena Henderson. I, I got this right the first time. Ali Lima, and I think I, is that close, I hope? Yeah, it's very close, nailed it. All right, thank you so much. Um, the topic is the tragedy of the commons, climate and national security. Yeah, so again, thank you for inviting us here today. It's just a pleasure to be here. And I'm really looking forward to, to discuss with you all about climate change and national security. And I actually find it pretty interesting and fascinating to be able to discuss the two topics simultaneously, because not long ago, climate change as a national security threat was rarely discussed in the same sentence. Um, however, more recently, and especially with our new administration, more emphasis is being placed uh, as climate change as a top threat to our national security. So today uh, we're gonna start by examining how national security threats have traditionally been defined and how that definition is expanding. And then we'll talk about what is climate change and why is climate change considered a national security threat. So to start, historically, the constitution made national security a top priority of the government requiring the federal government to protect the nation against invasion, to provide for a common defense. This notion 
led to national security threats being narrowly defined solely in military terms focused on security and protection against a military attack from an adversary. Uh, however, with the rise of post-World War II and globalization combined with technological advantages, it created an increasingly interconnected and complex security environment. And faced with this reality, it became clear to our national leaders that defining national security objectives solely in terms of defending against a foreign adversary created blind spots in our understanding and addressing non-military dimensions of national security. Therefore, we have an understanding of what constitutes a national security threat. It's evolved greatly. And now threats may come from non-military dimensions such as pandemics and economic insecurity and cybersecurity and climate change, to name a few. Uh, so let's define climate change. Climate change is a long-term change in average weather patterns, changes in temperature and precipitation, as example. Impacts of climate change include rising sea levels, rising temperature, shrinking glaciers, and it can also cause more intense and frequent extreme weather events such as droughts, floods, hurricanes, and heat waves. And so now let's talk about that climate national security connection and how climate change creates a national security threat. So first, climate change heightens and intensifies social and political instability in vulnerable and contested regions that adversaries of the United States can exploit to further their interests. Second, climate change is a direct threat to US military installations and our ability to maintain our military combat readiness. And regarding the first threat of instability, the military, we recognize that while climate change alone does not cause conflict and instability, it acts as a, a threat multiplier, essentially exasperating existing tensions and instability. And that's particularly in regions characterized by a history of fragile governments. So we'll have unforeseen extreme weather events linked to climate change, such as hurricanes or heat waves or flooding, mega droughts, they'll intensify and disrupt access to food, water and resources. And fragile governments unable to quickly respond to these mounting food, water, health, employment, sanitation, all these different crises, this lack of government response to these basic needs of its citizens can erupt and escalate into riots, conflict, tension, and violence. For example, there was a study published in the National Academy of Science that linked serious three-year drought a drought worsened by climate change to the Syrian civil war. The extreme weather event caused widespread agricultural collapse and drove a mass migration of Syrian farming families into the urban centers. And then there came this competition over food, water, jobs, already scarce following decades of low governance. It took on this ethnic dimension, helping trigger that civil war that was linked to kill hundreds and thousands of people. Instability it poses a national security threat because adversaries exploit unstable regions, which in turn causes an increased demand on US military engagement and uh, employment. We'll have extremists and terrorists, they'll turn to these unstable regions into their breeding grounds for terrorist movements. And these movements have the potential to target large democracies and Western ideals like ourselves. And when Americans targeted by terrorism, we have to respond in kind with counterterrorism measurements, which increases our need and our military's engagements in different regions. And furthermore, terrorist organizations, they, they attempt to weaken and undermine their local governments by providing for the people in the ways the government can't. So to do this, the terrorists will they'll seek and control and weaponize these key resources and infrastructure. And regional infrastructure, such as transportation systems, overseas military bases, energy grids, military logistical hubs, and waterways, they're weaponized and they're controlled. And regional infrastructure, that's very critical to our military's ability to rapidly deploy and operate and sustain anywhere in the world at any time, and to essentially project our power globally. And when we lose these key power projection platforms and key resources to terrorists, that limits America's ability to advance our interests globally. 
Therefore, there's a need to maintain access to the resources, and that also increases our military's need to engage in a region. And then we think about terrorists and violent extremists and criminal organizations. They're not the only ones who attempt to exploit the impacts of climate change. The warming Arctic, for example, that brings increased interest and competition and military presence from our adversaries, particularly the People's Republic of China and Russian Federation as they seek to control very strategically important territory and resources. There's interest and competition. It's increasing that Arctic region as these, these great powers we all try to grab and control for influence in that region that was previously closed by the, the, the glacier ice. So we have these melting Arctic sea caps and they're strategically important because for example, the Arctic, it contains an estimated 13% of the world's discovered oil, 30% of undiscovered gas and trillions of dollars worth of gold, zinc, nickel, and other precious metals. And the, the melting ice, it can also increase the, the use of the transatlantic routes. So there's three routes which can save hundreds and thousands of miles and several sailing days between a major sea block. In fact, Putin recently named those new Arctic routes as the new Suez Canal. So we have attempts to control and expand our fear of influence in these regions. It's usually going to incite competition and, and, and conflict rather than cooperation. So then we have this flashpoint that will call, require more attention and engagement and further military uh, militarization of that region. Another impact of climate change is it affects and degrades our military's combat readiness. The Army defines readiness as the ability of its forces to fight and succeed in assigned missions, the ability to fight when anywhere at any given time. And having a combat ready force, it dissuades our adversaries from acting against our interests. It's a deterrence. And we also need that combat ready force to the fight if deterrence fails. The two categories that influence heavily on readiness for our military is training and equipment. Do our armed forces have to train personnel and is their equipment in good working order? Training and equipment are critical to national security because these activities enable us to remain competitive and capable ready force and to also protect our interests. And so when there's an increase in currents and intensity of extreme weather events, such as flooding or drought or extreme heat, sea level, level, light, or sea level risings, they all disrupt training and equipment testing in our operationally critical installations. And we have in the military 79 of these operationally critical installations throughout, and the majority of them are vulnerable to climate change disruption. For example, you'll have droughts that dry out the vegetation and they increase temperature. Under drought conditions, the potential for the wildfires increases and so does heat-related injuries, heat strokes and exhaustion. And these impacts delay the days that we can actually train and test our equipment. Furthermore, we'll have coastal flooding and then these flooding events and storm surges, they can also impact readiness by limiting the access to installations and also triggering cancellations of previously scheduled training and equipment. So there's an example, we had Tyndall Air Force Base and that experienced major flooding from the Hurricane Michael. And for months and months after the storm, training and equipment maintenance and schedules for one third of the nation's stealth fighter jets was disrupted. Then that very same year we had at Camp Lejeune, it's a Marine base, it was so badly damaged by uh, Hurricane Florence that the Marine Corps Commandant came out and said that one third of the Marines combat power was degraded just because of that one hurricane. Ultimately, these days and total and months and weeks of disruption, they accumulate and they have a direct impact on national security. And so the takeaway is that deterioration of the climate is causing the United States significant security concerns from growing instability to the possible a great power conflict to decline in readiness, climate change is disrupting the impacts and our ability to protect Americans' interests. But there's good news. Although the connection between climate change and national security did not receive much attention and prioritization before, 
there's this growing acknowledgement within the military community that we have to prepare uh, in order to protect our national interests. President Biden, for example, he nominated John Kerry to this new position as a special presidential envoy for climate. And in this position, he gave him a seat at the National Security Council. And that's, that's the first ever that a climate envoy became into the national security discussions. And after Kerry's announcement, he said, America will soon you know, have a government that treats the climate threat as the urgent national security threat it is. And that appointment of John Kerry reflects President Biden's belief that climate change is a national security third concern. And so we have this new acknowledgement and prioritization, and that's helping the military and giving us a chance to demonstrate that one of the largest organizations with respect to personnel, equipment, budget, and logistics that we too can go green. So I appreciate your time today and I, I look forward to your questions um, and how I can further elaborate. Great, thank you so much, uh, Colonel Henderson, Ali Lima. Um, very interesting presentation, lots of issues that uh, touch on national security um, that maybe uh, aren't always thought of um, in, in some way. So um, I think we'll get some very interesting questions here, but uh, first we'll go to our final pre presenter, uh, Colonel Adisa King, uh, who's presenting the mass destruction that we commit with every click, polarization and the breakdown of civil discourse. So I thought about just causing chaos right now and having everybody turn the camera on so I can see you, but I won't do that. But I saw a couple of rooms, but that's okay. I, we, we won't do that. It is okay. Uh, but no, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll get this thing started. One, thank you all for doing this. This is uh, phenomenal. And I want to make sure we don't disappoint. And uh, we're going to have a little fun here. So stay with me, please. <clears throat> so I know, do you remember the last time anybody, you, you posted anything on the internet that was controversial? Was it political? How did you decide whether it was worth sharing? With the emotions, did you consider reflection? But right now, what I'm finding, unfortunately, a post, a forward, a retweet, or a blog that's devoid of facts has half-truths and opinions purported as facts fuels polarization in our society. See, this polarization leads to a term that anthropologists call a new word, listen for it, schismogenesis, or division. This division threatens our constitution and our democracy. Moreover, this polarization and schismogenesis is not confined to the United States. It, it's occurring with our international partners and our allies. So I'm, I'm not a social scientist, I'm not a political theorist, and I'm not a lawyer. But as a senior leader in the military, I pay attention to topics like these because they affect national security. What I am finding out is that malign actors on an international level and even some domestic exploit our psychology and internet activity to cause discord with each other. And it causes discord with our allies, partners. They create conditions that challenge shared ideas and longstanding treaties. See this discord and this polarization, they've been exacerbated through disinformation and it creates an unhealthy and unsafe environment. So therefore, as a strategic leader, as a national security practitioner, I wanna share several ways we can kind of work together to, to address this challenge and really close the divide. So where do we start, all right? Every infantryman, we start with something, but we're gonna give you like five things, maybe three, maybe two. I'm gonna give you five. I'll call the first five letters of the ABCs. First, agree that there's a problem. B, bias. Number three, critical thinking. D, develop a dialogue. And the last one, educate and engage. This is gonna be hard. And at times it's complex because it's a human endeavor. But as an infantry officer, I know firsthand interpersonal challenges of influencing my troops, the enemy, and the population of people that we're supposed to protect while deployed. So I've used some of these concepts in Baghdad, Bagram, Washington, DC, and in my own home. So let me share some of these concepts for you uh, and get in a little bit more detail. So A, agreement. Acknowledging that there's a problem is a good start, but we need to ask ourselves if we are part of the problem. See, after the murder of George Floyd, I received a notification on YouTube, on a YouTube queue. 
It said the stories of Black Americans who fled to the USSR to escape race discrimination. So I did what every consumer, y'all know y'all do it too. You look on TikTok, you look on Facebook, what do you do to validate if it's true? To validate if it's legit, you look at how many views there were there, you look at how recent was the post, and see in the military, we call this last time information of value. The more information that's there, the more recent it is, and the veracity of information, we tend to believe that is more likely to be true. See, this video, it connected with my emotion. It was new information, novelty, and I wanted to share it ASAP. So what did I do? I grabbed my phone and I was ready to go. I was about ready to start sharing with my family and everybody. And then I saw at the top of the program, at least on there, I said RT. I said, okay, what is RT? See, RT stands for Russia Today, and it's regarded as a slicky, produce broad covert disinformation campaign designed to sow doubt about our democratic institutions and destabilize the West. See, after reading the 2017 um, with the intelligence community assessment on Russian activities and the intentions in 2016 election, this was cold water on my face. I was about to copy, paste, and post on several platforms and spread information that contributes to the distrust of our democracy. Democracy. So Houston, Army, we have a problem. America, we have a problem. And I was about to contribute to the situation. So let's start with B, bias. Bias, bias, bias. Cognitive bias is not necessarily a bad thing because some biases are form, they form a fast and efficient decision-making that helps us, keeps us alive in a crisis. But rarely do you have to tweet a post to keep yourself alive. See, our current internet engines, uh, search engines and social platforms, they appear to be unbiased. However, they use algorithms, okay, to exploit and monetize these cognitive biases. And they feed information that supports our beliefs. And they make more recommendations that confirms our thinking. This right here can skew our own beliefs and lead us to demonize any idea that counters our way of thinking. So sharing or retweeting without really reflecting exposes others to the cycle, to that little cycle of, of division, that cycle of, of misinformation just and manipulation. It just continues to continues to go. So now what? After analyzing the 2018 Rand study called Truth Decay, I gained three clues, three clues to help break in this cycle. Number one. Be curious about why your friends or family are posting this information, whatever it may be. Number two, be aware of the echo chambers that you might be in. Beware of those echo chambers. And number three, be ready to challenge your bias through reflection, question, and research. Now, let's move to C, okay? Critical thinking, critical thinking, critical thinking to challenge your bias and the digital consumption that you have that, that can per perpetuate polarization, we must systematically develop our thought process through critical thinking. See, my most impactful professional military education that I received after 10 years in the Army occurred at the Command and General Staff College at Fort, Fort, Kansas, Fort, um, Fort Leavenworth. Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, okay? Not the prison, but the school. And the thing, about the, the thing about the school is this, our foundational class on critical thinking opened my eyes to my thought process of why I was thinking the way I was, why and what biases were out there. There's these things called 44 dirty tricks people play when you're having a conversation or an argument. And this little book here, this little book right here changed my whole idea about critical thinking. Very important book and I'll share it with you all later. But the thing that I will tell you this, the most critical and relevant thing about this conversation that we're having today about critical thinking, there's three things, three things I will tell you about it today. Number one, challenge your assumptions. Number two, determine if your assumptions are justifiable, okay? You have to determine that they're justifiable. And the last thing when it comes to critical thinking is understand that your assumptions and how they shape your views. See, this requires practice, okay? And, and you have to execute this with friends, family, faculty, 
because doing this can help close that divide that we're currently in. Now let's go to D. D, develop a dialogue. See, developing a dialogue with people with the opposite view can enhance your understanding of issues and concerns. Also, it can expose some disinformation. And, and, and it really starts, when you do that, you really start to have a real honest dialogue when you begin to expose that disinformation. See, developing these systems and these processes are very, very important. The concept that I found out and, and through my study that I found out that is most important comes from Dr. Nicholas Epley. He's a professor of behavior science and he describes perspective getting. See, this requires you to shut up and listen with your own biases. Listen, understanding that you know your biases, but shut up and listen to someone else. So I had an opportunity about three weeks ago. I had a dialogue three weeks ago with this couple that felt very comfortable talking to me. They were asking me about affirmative action, Black Lives Matter, the military, race, uh, the, the insurrection, and the, the capital insurrection. And, and I had to shut up and listen to their perspective. The second part of that is not demonizing them, but I said, okay, I thought of how might we questions? How might we better understand their perspective? How might we better understand my perspective of, hey, a young black man in this country or a white or a doesn't matter, gay, it doesn't matter. How might we better understand each other so we can have a civil discourse? See, the challenge will be, how do you reconcile differences right now with dialogue versus demonization? So that is something that I think we're looking for when I say develop a dialogue. Now, let's go to E, 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 the last one. Stay with me. I will have you turn cameras on, but I won't do that. Here's the deal, educate and engage. If we are truly concerned about polarization and closing the divide, we need to look at democracies that are attacking disinformation the best. Finland is killing it. They're doing, Finland has institutionalized critical thinking on multiple platform information literacy. Again, multiple platform information literacy as part of their national curriculum in their secondary schools. See students and faculty, they study statistics. They then look at statistics and see how they can, statistics can be manipulated. They also look at the histories of the propaganda campaigns and how it is affected in history. And young children right now are understanding it. And what is the intent of this? The intent is to make citizens that care, that can have civil discourse, be responsible voters, and they are not easily manipulated or polarized. So in closing, our country has, I tell you, we do have some challenges. We have our fair issues when it comes to race, poverty, immigration, crime, all of it, Just we just named, right? The climate, we have these issues. But many subjects, they can, they can get an emotional response out of us. But our connections through multiple platforms provide an opportunity to have civil dialogue, to address this problem. The more so what I look at, the fabric of our democracy is our people. So understanding the end state of polarization and how it occurs will help us re-examine our own behavior with each other. Moreover, the first five letters of the ABCs, you never think of ABCs anymore, but like this, the first five letters of ABCs can get us on the right track so we can stop aiding and abetting in the destruction of our civil society. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Colonel King. Uh, very interesting and, and a path forward uh, for, for some of these issues that um, I think highlights what I know I want to do as a professor, especially the critical thinking. So uh, thanks for, for that point, especially, but um, all of them. Um, thank you for the great presentations all, to all of our panelists. Um, I'm going to open up with a, a question of my own and, and then ask Dr. Bose if, if she has a question, and then we'll open up questions to the audience. Um, and I kind of, I would like to try to link all three presentations and, and topics if I can in some ways. Um, immigration is divisive um, and the way that Colonel Bartran spoke about it um, 
even in that way, focusing on scientific um, or STEM immigration or issues related to, to STEM in the immigration system um, become part of a very divisive conversation at times. Um, certainly climate change, um, what uh, Colonel uh, Henderson Ali Lama was, was, was uh, discussing. Um, we have those who simply deny its existence and sometimes the conversations just stop um, at that point. Um, and Colonel King sort of pointing out sort of the dangers of, of, of this kind of stuff. I, I, don't, I don't wanna put this all on your shoulders, but these are, are as national security issues, um, things that have to be addressed. That is the, the nature of national security. These are things that states are bound to address in one way or the other. So how do we get past um, the divisiveness within those two issues. Um, how do we come to a consensus to deal with um, the resources that are needed to deal with climate change and immigration issues and do in a, a way that, that goes along with what's, um, you know, Colonel King's perspective of um, creating a stronger, more unified country out of this. So I, I, I throw this out to all of the panelists and I know it's broad and, and big, but I'm just, um, any of you that would like to, to answer that, it would be wonderful. Hi. Sorry. Hey, you wanna go ahead? Um, I'll say two things and I'm gonna pass it off to you. Number one is Congress, okay? Number one, okay? is Congress. Um, the subset of that, what I look at is uh, based off my understanding, this is kind of a, we, we call it a modernization issue. Um, um, and when I say that, there's certain funding, there's these earmarks, everybody know what earmarks are, right? Right, we, we, we kind of said we wanted to get rid of that. But when you actually look at the detail, earmarks does two things. It says, it allows compromise. It allows that I'm specifically going to earmark this thing and I'm gonna tell you what it's going for and what is it for. It is transparency. So when Congress can compromise and have a transparency, so I'm not hiding money, everyone can see it. What that ends up doing is say, you know what? We can do something about climate climate change in this, in this state or in this state and we can put certain money to it and I want this money to go towards that. And it's going to help out your state and I'm going to help and I'm going to vote for you. So what I'm, that, that's the one part that I've learned and from my study of how you can, how you can really kind of get somebody to start answering some of these issues when it comes to climate change, when it comes to immigration. Uh, but you have to really start with Congress because that's where I found out uh, just from my study and an interaction and talking with people and, and my, my, my experience as well when I was in the uh, uh, legislative liaison is that when that went away, the person with the loudest voice is trying to raise money. So guess what? I don't need to compromise. Why would I compromise? You can't save the world if you can't save your seat. So that's why I will tell you, that's when I look at our congressmen and our personnel, the people have to be involved. Uh, James, I'll pass it off to you. Over. Uh, I love what Adisa, Adisa said about Congress. But let's talk a little bit about the legislative branch of government, right? All politics are local politics. So, and, and he touched on it really well with earmarks. But while we are facing the internal issues that we are facing right now, we have to really ask ourselves, you know, at what level is this interest? Is it a survival, existential threat? Is it a vital interest? Is it major or is it? peripheral? Is it something that we're just willing to spend money on or talk about? You know, with, with regards to immigration, my personal opinion is we're going to be seeing this issue for a very long time because there's a lot of incentives to not really do much about it. And from a local politics perspective, uh, you know, we put our money where our mouth is and what really is important to us is what we spend money on. Um, unless there are a lot of local politic issues, in Congress that create a majority to spend money on things within a budget, it's gonna remain the same. I'll follow on and say that a tool is not a strategy. And even a good tool 
used incorrectly is a failed strategy to begin with. So whether it be a wall or people or unmanned aerial vehicles, what have you, it's just a tool and it's only as good as the strategy you develop around it. So once we identify the level of interest and we identify the strategy you know, for which we want to take this on to carry out our political objectives, you know, then you know, we can start to discuss how we want to move forward. And last thing I'll say, and I'll hand it off to Rena if she wants to say anything is, while we have the government, think of that as kind of the rational, I mean, I know legislative, it's hard to think that sometimes, but think of that as the rational arm of the government or the people, the, the state, it's the rational side. And then you have the people, which is the emotional, you know, it's the irrational emotional. And uh, I love the book by uh, Noah Harari. I'm sorry if I mispronounced his last name, but uh, he's written several books. But in one of his books, uh, 21 Ideas for the 21st Century, he talks about how people vote um, and push government and democratic society with how they feel, not necessarily how they think. Right. So right now, if you look at the national interest from a passion perspective, immigration is not high on the list. It, it's there in my opinion, but what, what's more important are some of the racial disparities, right? Uh, employment and dealing with the pandemic. Uh, and I would think immigration is close to that, but I think those are really high up on the list and they're influencing the government, right? And they're influencing policy. So in my opinion, the immigration problem is going to be here to stay for quite some time. Um, but, you know, those three factors, I think, are what's most effective. Great question. Rena, did you have anything you wanted to say? Yes. So you had mentioned it's kind of polarized and very kind of could be political at times and you're a hundred percent correct. So as early as 2016, we had a, a, Senate, a representative from Colorado that said, hey, the military should only be worried about ISIS. There's no need for them to look and worry about the climate. Now, as we're coming along as early as 2018. So just a few years later, we actually had a National Defense Authorization Act and the National Defense Authorization Act, that's where Congress gives the money and the resources for us to do these military programs. They actually start to say that, hey, I do recognize climate change is a threat to national security. So what's interesting about that is my colleagues mentioned Congress and they also mentioned the, the public. Um, Colonel Barton mentioned that. So what you also start to see at that exact same time is that as recently as 2020, public opinion uh, about climate change as a national security threat, 60% of the public is now viewing climate change as a threat that Congress and the, public, the president should address. So public can very much influence and shape the agenda of the Congress and the president. So that we're lucky in that respect that, hey, American public and that sentiment and understanding that this is having an impact on us is kind of turning around that now we're starting to see the resources in Congress responding in kind to that. Um, so with Congress doing the money and the resources, every single National Defense Authorization Act from 2018, 19, 20, and 21 have now included provisions to address the impacts of climate change. So we're lucky in that respect. Beforehand, when it was so polarized um, to the point where the, it had came out that the former president had said that it was a hoax from China because they were trying to make um, American businesses less effective. At that point, the, the former president had rescinded all kinds of um, programs and incentives of, of moving towards climate change um, adaption strategies, but the military was able to find that workaround by identifying and separating the argument of climate change from the threats that it really does cause. And so just being able to recognize that, hey, whether you believe it or not, these are the threats that we have identified. And as any other threat, we need to address it. And we need resources to address it. That was another workaround that we were able to um, keep going with those programs even in that polarized climate. But luckily, as mentioned, Congress is moving slowly towards funding it and just in the same tune as the American public is more and more understanding that there will be impacts. 
fascinating answers all around. I just want to follow up in, in the sense that the bureaucratic politics there are uh, really quite interesting because the elected representatives maybe in some cases were the most skeptical, but the DOD or I'm sorry, Department of Defense is able to find a way to still work in the priorities of uh, that are identified in that way. So it's, it's something that um, creates an interesting dynamic there for sure. And, and the similar, you know, I, I think it, you know, something with, with immigration reform could be similar too, but it, and it raises questions of um, where the source of disinformation, where the source of polarization and divisiveness is coming from uh, in a lot of ways, and what are the institutions and responsible actors that uh, can do things to, to address that. Um, maybe sometimes they're going to be the big bureaucracy. So we'll see. <laughs> so, but, but thank you. I do want to turn it over to my colleague, Mina Bose, uh, to see if she would like to ask any questions. Thank you, Paul. And thank you um, to all three of our speakers. Um, I have many questions, but I'm going to ask, I'll restrict myself to one. And why don't I also say that as I'm asking this, um, if students would like to start sending questions to Dr. Fritz and to me, um, after this one, I think we'll open it up so we get some time for, uh, for the student voices to be heard. Um, these three presentations complemented very well. Uh, I think uh, Colonel Bartrand's focus on a specific aspect of immigration policy, which I think fits very well with how the US policymaking process works, tends to be incremental more than comprehensive. Um, Colonel Henderson, Ali Lima's uh, discussion of climate change and national security and how I think explained very well how climate change is connected to so many different aspects of defense policy and American foreign policy choices. And then Colonel King's presentation on civil discourse and polarization and the process and how the process, how the political process can move forward these necessary policy changes. Here's what I think is particularly interesting. In the response to Dr. Fritz's, Paul Fritz's question, we heard a discussion of Congress, of public opinion, and Paul, you brought up bureaucratic politics. No one has mentioned the president. <laughs> and, um, I just think that that's interesting for a panel on national security challenges, when our focus is really in national security, um, particularly since the end of World War II, on the White, on White House leadership. Uh, president Biden's interim national security guidance actually discusses extensively climate change, uh, includes a brief discussion of immigration, and I think refers to civil discourse through the discussion of strengthening renewal American democracy. Here's my question. Um, how can presidential leadership create an integrated strategy and a plan for action? So recognizing a tool is not a strategy, hope is not a strategy, right? What are the goals? And what is the realistic plan to um, to incorporate a large scale issue such as climate change that it is part of really every aspect of national security? Um, hopefully, make some incremental progress in immigration, if not larger scale immigration reform. And I believe the bill that's in Congress incorporates the H one B visas as part of a larger comprehensive plan. Um, whether that can be passed in pieces is, I think, a very much an open question. And then how does the White House lead on uh, this, what I think is really the fundamental question of civil discourse? And, and can they do so in a two-year period before the midterm elections, uh, before the next presidential election, in our system of American politics of fixed terms uh, for our national institutions? How do we ensure this building process, if you will, for um, improving civil discourse. So I'm afraid that's a rather large question, but I'll turn it over to our speakers. Um. Okay, that was that was an awesome question. And I really want to jump on it real quick, and then I'll, I'll let you go with you said, but I, I couldn't couldn't resist. But um, I'll just say that um, I think in part, the president actually has the easiest job because we know what the problems are, and he's identifying it in the strategic documents. I think the reason we kind of 
lumped onto Congress is that's the difficult part is building that consensus across the union to then spend money on that. I think that's the hard part. But when we talk about strategy, what's suitable, acceptable, feasible, and is it balanced by risk, right? So as we develop our grant strategy, it needs to meet those three criteria and, it, and we need to know the level of risk we're accepting nationally and be willing to either take it on or adjust. So I think that's step one of your question. With regards to immigration, I actually really like what, this is again, my opinion, I like where the Biden administration is going in their interim guidance, and that is to address the problem south of the border. We need to find ways in some of these Latin American and South American countries that are transiting and immigrants that are transiting through Mexico to give them a pathway to get to the United States without coming through Mexico. Because as we're finding, as they come through Mexico, uh, the cartels and a lot of other uh, crime syndicates are, are getting involved and they're selling basically passes to go through their territory. That's causing all sorts of human trafficking issues, uh, murders, et cetera. And uh, as we've seen this bulk increase in you know, young children arriving at the border with no adults or guardians, that's a big part of it. So rather than just pouring more resources at it or more tools at the border, let's go down and try to address the problem. The, the economic disparities, uh, the issues with people who want to come to this country and produce, but they don't have a safe way to get here. Let's try to address some of those issues. Uh, and I believe I answered most of the question, but I'm gonna let my colleagues address any parts I did not get to, but uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, hi, so I thought it was so interesting that you picked up that no one really mentioned the president. Um, and that's so cool because really what it comes down to is that although presidents change every four to eight years, U.S. core interests as evident through the national security strategies that they put out and those interim strategies, they're fairly enduring. So we might have presidents changing all over the place, but our vital interests, they, they typically throughout the years and years and years lie in maintaining American sovereignty through physical security of the homeland and protection, protecting American life, promoting American values, a stable international order and economic prosperity. Even our former president pretty much had that all on the same line. Our new president has it on the same line. Really doesn't matter if you're Democrat or um, Republican, those interests are pretty much set in stone. And so when we talk about the president, it more becomes a, a leadership and how they prioritize and make policy towards those interests. And that's where the really big um, nail on the head comes in. And, and when you had mentioned about how do they incorporate it, uh, it's just about what messages and the level of prioritization that they have when they, they say what they need to go afford. So you can see in President Biden's, he prioritizes diplom diplomacy rather than using the military as a tool. He'll prioritize climate change and really building up our domestic base as opposed to um, other things. And that's a really big mental shift for the military that usually when there's a problem, maybe the military can solve it. Will President Biden say, hey, we have state departments and we have domestic things that we need to look into now. And then you mentioned how do we kind of lead in that civil discord? It kind of reminded me of an article I actually read today where um, former President Bush was saying like, why is everyone so surprised that me and Michelle Obama are best friends? Um, but it kind of gets to the heart of the matter where um, former First Lady Obama was saying like, hey, we have the same values. We might differ on policy, but all across the board, we have the same values. And I think that if people can kind of get back to the basics that we are all Americans, we all have those four vital interests at heart. We all want to live that American dream and just kind of get back to that basis um, that will help lead us through this region of weirdness right now, polarization, and just not being the right thing. So hope that answers. Man, that was awesome. I like it. <laughs> well, two things. The only thing I add just to what um, James said is, you know, when we talk about the feasibility, acceptable and suitable is time. Okay. Time. We have to understand time and how well we can that time of what he has to to lead us through this, right? And the other thing that I think that they're doing right now, you asked what the president can do, is communication. 
his communication and his team is is sustainable, is clear, and at times is concise. And he's is not necessarily get a, getting ahead, but he is he just he's staying on point. They are staying on message, right? And that's the thing that that's our international partners they see. But he also knows it is not clear cut. I mean, it's skillful when he said, "Hey, listen, I'm gonna put some out there." And then we can talk about it and take it away versus throw your hands up and ah, oh, don't know what to do. Right. And that's why I get back to Congress. He knows that he knows he has to put something on the table and hey, he's willing to discuss it. That's what Congress do because they work for the people and the president leads it. So there you go.